Cyril Ramaphosa has called on South Africans to celebrate the country's 30th democratic anniversary using their constitution as their basis. In his last State of the Nation address before the 2024 elections, Ramaphosa urged South Africans not to allow anyone to diminish vital democratic institutions. Professor Sipo Sipe is a political analyst and former Deputy Vice Chancellor for Institutional Support at the University of Zululand. He tells me President Ramaphosa misrepresented the South African reality. What the president sought to do, that instead of looking at his own promises of the last six years, he decided to cast his eyes back to 1994, when there was a sense of promise. The promise that Mandela spoke about of a country in which all persons live in harmony and with equal opportunities. The reality today is that that ideal remains very elusive. And most commentators have said Ramaphosa's presidency has actually reversed all the gains that were made in the last eight years. Professor, first of all, let me go to the issue of energy. The president spoke about that. We know that South Africans have been experiencing this low shedding. Do you think the president addressed the issue to your satisfaction? No. The people remember that the low shedding came after he took over. We had low shedding before during President Zuma's time, and that was resolved for three years. And when President Zuma stepped down, President Ramaphosa came in. That's when low shedding came back. So people are tired of his promise of ending low shedding, and he continues to repeat this. It is uh, still amazing that uh, when you have a, a challenge that is complex, you'll come up with uh, simplistic solutions that you know full well will not work. The president uh, also spoke about crime and insecurity. Uh, He said that South Africans deserve to live freely. Your comment? Well, that is uh, correct. That's what we expect from any government. We have seen since it took over escalating crime. The rate of murders has increased. So we are not doing better as a country. So the president says all these things that people know to be obvious. But then what he does not own up is that under his administration, things have become worse. If we deal with the notion of corruption, the Transparency International and the Corruption Watch in South Africa, and also another survey by Afrobarometer had indicated that under Ramaphosa, corruption has become worse. This is why the ANC has been progressively losing support. So what the president is saying is not uh, consistent with reality. President Ramaphosa highlighted South Africa's role in the Russia-Ukraine war, also the Israel-Hamas war. He reiterated that all conflicts must end through negotiations. Well, there's uh, nothing brilliant about that. That is uh, a position that uh, most countries have actually done. But what Ramaphosa has actually done is to always seek any opportunity for public relations. When they went to Ukraine and to Russia, they achieved nothing. All they said is exactly the same thing. There's no one in this world who does not believe that the negotiations are the best course of action. But the, for African leaders and our president, anything that gives them a photo opportunity is seen as a success. What South Africa has done with the, uh, the International Court of Justice is the correct thing because we as a peace-loving people we cannot sit idly and watch when we see some genocidal actions taking place and for that the president must be praised and South African government is praised but people at home are saying in the same way that you're concerned about the land occupation there what about uh, the fact that the Africans in the country of their birth, in the country of their forebears, still occupy less than five percent when are you going to address our issues at home Professor Sipo Sipe is a political analyst and a former deputy vice chancellor for institutional support at the University of Zululand. He was speaking with us from Johannesburg. In Guinea Conakry, the most powerful labor unions have notified the government that they will hold a nationwide strike. The unions are calling for the immediate and unconditional release of the Secretary General of the Professional Private Press Association of Guinea and the reduction in prices of foodstuffs. Reporter Karim Kamara has more.
The Guinean government recently added a 20% charge on the cost of importing food into the country. This increase has had repercussions on the market prices of basic food items, such as rice, which is a stable food, oil, flour, and onions. To the dismay of consumers, the government has increased the price of a bag of rice in Conakry about 50% and about 70% in rural areas. Fatibata Fofana is a market trader who has a request for junta leader Mamadi Dumboya. She says he should try to alleviate the suffering. She says if a husband is not working and a wife's business is not flourishing, then families are facing hopeless struggle. She says Dumbuya must try to develop the country. Hardship has increased for average Guinean since fuel depot in Conakry caught fire in December. Economist Mohamed Kamara blames the government for the price increases and warns that Guinea is heading for high inflations. He says low-class families in Conakry spend 60% of their revenues on food and they are directly affected by price increases. He says inflation will worsen if there is not a sufficient amount of local food product to meet consumers' need. The government and importers signed an agreement last month not to add a cent above what the current price of rice per bag, oil, flour and onions. The Minister of Commerce, Lupo Lama, has warned of dire consequences for anyone who violates the agreement. She says they are asking the business community to make sure that the objective behind the agreement is respected. She says a hotline 142 is open to report all violations, whether it is the retention of goods or added price increases. The government agreed to supply the Guinean market with food items and with reasonable prices this year. But according to traders and consumers, the government has done nothing to meet its promises. And this is why prices of rice and other food continue to rise despite government threats. Labor unions have remained silent despite reports of poor governance, corruption and human rights violations by the junta. But now they have for the first time accused the junta of starving Guineans and have notified the government that they will strike in the days to come. Kader Aziz Kamara is a spokesman for the unions. He says they have notified the government and their next action will be to set a date for a nationwide strike. He says they are calling on all social groups affected by the incarceration of Seku Pandesa, the Secretary General of the Private Press Association of Guinea, who was arrested after he called for a street protest by journalists. The International Confederation of Labor Unions, based in Geneva and those in Africa, including right groups in Guinea, are calling for the immediate and unconditional release of Pendesa, but to no avail. Pendesa was arrested after he called for a protest by journalists to denounce the high handedness on the press by the junta. He has since been charged with taking part in an unlawful gathering and disturbing public peace. Zimbabwe's cabinet decision to abolish the death penalty announced on Wednesday is being held by human rights advocates, but not all Zimbabweans are in favor of the move. Amnesty International, one of the rights groups which has pushed for the abolition of capital punishment in Zimbabwe, welcomed the announcement this week by Harali. Zimbabwe has taken the right step towards ending this abhorrent and inhuman form of punishment that has no place in today's justice system. Said Rosaline Muzelengi, campaign's coordinator at Amnesty International in Zimbabwe. Now that the cabinet has given its nod, parliament must ensure the death penalty is truly abolished by voting to pass legislation that will make this a reality. We are happy that the abolition debate is gaining momentum. So as an organization, we are waiting to see the response by the Parliament of Zimbabwe. In a message via WhatsApp, UN Special Rapporteur Mary Roller, who reports and advises on the situation of human rights advocates, also expressed her support for the above. But not everyone is happy with the decision given that Zimbabwe's crime rate is rising and the economy continues to decline. 
SNH for the ruling Zan PF party, who asked not to be identified for fear of losing her position, said she is against abolition of the death penalty. As a people, as a nation, and are we not perpetuating wanton killing? Life is precious. Life imprisonment in itself is torture, she said. We have a parole system, which is there in place, that can review some of these judgments, life imprisonment, peace and closure to the affected families can only be achieved if they know what the perpetrator is made the same fate as their relatives. Zimbabwe's Information Minister Jenfani Muswele this week told reporters that the move to abolish the death penalty was made after countrywide consultations. Circumstances attracting death penalty options include where murder has been committed against a prison officer, police officer, a minor or a pregnant woman, or it is committed in the commission of other serious crimes or where there is premeditation, Muswele said. In view of the need to retain the deterrent element in sentencing murderers, it is expected that the new law will impose lengthy sentences without violating the rights to life. Some Zimbabweans, such as Tinel Mukuli, want the death sentence to remain in the statute.